You are about to embark upon the great crusade. Your task will not be an easy one. Your enemy is well trained, well equipped, and battle hardened. We will accept nothing less than full victory. Good luck, and let us all beseech the blessing of Almighty God upon this great and noble undertaking. Welcome back to the Army Flashcards Ranger School Podcast. I'm your host, Zach Wiley. Today's episode is episode 13, which is chapter 12 of the Ranger Handbook, Waterborne Operations. So before we begin, lately we've been working with a few other veteran companies and projects. Uh, Specifically, we've been working with the NCOPD podcast, which is run by an awesome non-commissioned officer in the Army. So we did two episodes with them recently, if you're interested in checking it out. You can check out that podcast on Podbean. Uh, It's called the NCOPD Podcast on Podbean. Um, So go check that out. And as always, be sure to check out our website, armyflashcards.com, for tons of free resources for Ranger School, including quizzes, a 100-question pre-Ranger test, uh, different flashcard sets. So be sure to check those out. And with that, let's begin. Chapter 12, Waterborne Operations. This chapter discusses rope bridges, poncho rafts, and watercraft. While conducting waterborne operations, all rangers will be in the waterborne uniform. Equipment is worn in the following order. 1. Pant legs unbloused. 2. Top zipped up, collar fastened. 3. Cuffs fastened. 4. Swimmer safety line tied utilizing an around the waist bowline with an end of rope bowline at arm's length with carabiners attached to collar. 5. Field load carrier, or flick, is unzipped. Rope bridge. Rope bridges are used when a battalion or smaller unit is required to conduct a covert gap crossing. A covert crossing is a planned crossing of an inland water obstacle or other gap that is intended to be undetected. A covert gap crossing can be used in a variety of situations to support various missions, but should be considered, as opposed to deliberate or hasty, only when there is a need or opportunity to cross a gap without being discovered. 12-1 The Ranger Patrol seldom have ready-made bridges, so they must know how to employ covert gap crossing techniques. The personnel needed to make a rope bridge are Ranger number 1, lead safety swimmer and far side lifeguard. Ranger number 2, swims water obstacle pulling 150 foot rope and ties off rope on far side anchor point. Ranger number 3, near side lifeguard is the last ranger to cross water obstacle. Ranger number 4, the bridge team commander or the BTC is the most knowledgeable person on the team. Rangers number 5 and 6, Rope Pullers. 12-2. For a wet crossing or a one-rope bridge, special equipment is needed. This includes two carabiners for each piece of heavy equipment, three steel carabiners for each 150-foot rope, one 7-foot utility rope for each person, swimmer safety line, two carabiners for each person, one clipped to swimmer safety line, and one tied to the top center frame of rucksack, two waterproof bags for each RTO, two carbon dioxide CO2 inflatable life preservers, scout swimmer vests, three non-inflatable life preservers, work vests, and two 150-foot nylon ropes. 12-3. A gap crossing annex, see table 2-14 on page 2-27, is prepared with the unit's op board. Special organization is accomplished at this time. For a platoon-sized patrol, a squad is normally given the task of providing the rope bridge team. The squad leader designates the most technically proficient ranger in the squad as the bridge team commander. Rehearsals and inspections take place. See figure 12-1. Emphasize security and actions on enemy contact, actual construction of the rope bridge on dry land within the 8-minute time standard, individual preparation, order of crossing, all signals and control measures, reorganization. 12-4. Conduct rehearsals as realistically as possible. Ensure personnel are proficient in the mechanics of a covert gap crossing operation. Inspect for equipment completeness. Correct rigging and preparation. Finalize weapon configurations, personnel knowledge, and understanding of the operation. During the preparation phase, Ranger number 4, the bridge team commander, rehearses the bridge team, accounts for all equipment in the bridge kit, and ensures the 150-foot rope is back stacked and properly coiled. 12-5. Once the execution phase is reached, several actions take place. This includes establishing and conducting a bridge for gap crossing. Leader halts short of the river, establishes local security, and recons the area for the presence of the enemy, 
and for crossing site suitability and necessity. The leader directs the BTC to construct the bridge. The BTC constructs a one rope bridge and selects near side and visibility permitting far side anchor points. To anchor himself to the bridge, the BTC ties a swimmer safety line around his waist and secures it with an overhand knot, then ties the free running end of the bowline into an overhand knot and attaches a carabiner to the loop in the knot. Ensure the bowline is just long enough to place a carabiner at arm's length. This allows the BTC to remain within reach of the rope bridge, should he lose his grip. The bridge team begins to establish the rope bridge while unit members begin individual preparation. Each ranger puts a carabiner in his end of the bowline and in front sight assembly of every M4 or M16. M240 gunners put a carabiner through the front sight assembly and rear swivel of their 240 machine gun. RTO FO and others with heavy rucksacks place an additional carabiner on the top center of their rucksack frames. Team establishes security upstream and downstream, while unit leader briefs the BTC on anchor points. The leader counts the rangers across. The BTC enforces noise and light discipline and maintains security. 12-6 The bridge team is responsible for constructing the rope bridge. Ranger number 1, the lead safety swimmer and far side lifeguard, grounds his rucksack with a carabiner through the top of the frame to the rear of the near side anchor point. He carries a knotted hand line or safety line to assume duties of far side lifeguard. Wear equipment in the following order from the body out. Waterborne uniform, top zipped up, neck collar fastened, and pants unbloused. Non-inflatable life preserver, CO2 inflatable life preserver. Field load carrier, weapon across the back, and swimmer safety line routed over all equipment and secured to the collar of the Army combat uniform blouse. 12-7. Ranger number one enters the water upstream from ranger number two and stays an arm's length away from ranger number two. Ranger number one identifies the far side anchor point upon exiting the water. Once ranger number two has exited the water, he moves to his far side lifeguard position downstream of the rope bridge with knotted hand line in hand, flick or weapon grounded, and non inflatable life preserver held in throwing hand. He continues to wear the CO2 inflatable life preserver. 12 8. Ranger number two, the rope swimmer, in waterborne uniform, same as ranger number one, grounds the rucksack with a carabiner through the top of the frame to the rear of the nearside anchor point. His duties are to swim across the water obstacle point the rope and tie off the rope on the anchor point identified by ranger number one with a round turn and two half hitches with a quick release. The direction of the round turn is the same direction as the flow of the water current to facilitate exit off of the rope bridge. Wear equipment in the following order from the body out. Non-inflatable life preserver. Field load carrier, weapon across the back, swimmer safety line tied utilizing an around the waist bowline. The carabiner of the swimmer safety line is routed through an end of the line bowline at arm's length and then secured by reattaching it to the swimmer safety line routed around the rope swimmer's waist in vicinity of the small of the back. 12-9. Ranger number 3 positions self on the downstream side of the near side anchor point before rangers number 1 and 2 enter the water. Ranger number 3, near side lifeguard, wears the same type of waterborne uniform as the far side lifeguard. He grounds the rucksack with a carabiner through the top of the frame on rear of the near side anchor point. After the PSG crosses and verifies the head count, ranger number one unties the quick release at the near side anchor point. Ranger number three is the last pulled across the water obstacle. Before crossing the water obstacle, ranger number three dons equipment in the following order. Non-inflatable life preserver, CO2 inflatable life preserver, field load carrier, weapon across the back, Swimmer safety line routed over all equipment and secured to the two carabiners already secured in the figure 8 slip of the transport tightening system. See figure 12-2. 12-10. Ranger number 4, the BTC, wears a standard waterborne uniform with flick and sling rope tied in the safety line around the waist bowline with end of line bowline no more than one arm's length. Ranger number 4 is responsible for construction of the rope bridge and organization of the bridge team and is responsible for back feeding the rope and tying the transport tightening system. He designates the near side anchor point, ties the figure 8 slip of the transport tightening system, and hooks all personnel to the rope bridge. He ensures that the transport tightening knot is on the upstream side of the rope bridge and ensures that all individuals are in the waterborne uniform, hooked into the rope facing upstream. Ranger number 4 ensures that the weapon is hooked onto the rope and controls the flow of traffic on the bridge. He is responsible for crossing with the rucksack of ranger number 1 and is generally the next to last ranger to cross, follows the platoon sergeant who is keeping a head count. 12-11. Ranger number 5 and 6, the rope pullers, wear the waterborne uniform with flick and safety line. They tighten the transport tightening knot. They also take the rucksacks of rangers number 2 and 3 across. Once they reach the far side, rangers 5 and 6 pull the last ranger number 3 across. 12-12. 12 
Rangers number 4, 5, and 6 transport the rucksacks of Rangers number 1, 2, and 3 across. To do so, they hook the rucksacks into the rope by running the carabiner through the top of the frames, then pulling the rucksacks across. They attach their weapons between themselves and the rucksack they are pulling across the bridge. 12-3 The BTC rehearses the bridge team during the planning sessions and then directs the construction and emplacement. The unit leader selects the crossing site, which complements the tactical plan. Ranger number 3 positions himself downstream of the crossing site. Ranger number 1 enters the water upstream of number 2, staying one arm's length from Ranger number 2, while prepared to render any assistance to Ranger 2. They stay together to help compensate for the current. BTC feeds rope out of the rucksack positioned on the downstream side of the near side anchor point. They stay together to help compensate for the current. BTC feeds rope out of the rucksack positioned on the downstream side of the near side anchor point. 12-14. Ranger number two exits and identifies the far side anchor point. If BTC cannot identify it for Ranger number two, Ranger number two exits on the upstream side of the far side anchor point. The rope is now routed to facilitate movement on and off the bridge. Radios and heavy equipment are double waterproofed and rigged. Rangers don waterborne uniforms and tie safety lines. Platoon Sergeant moves to anchor point and maintains accountability, utilizing a head count. 12-15 Ranger number 2 signals the BTC that the rope is temporarily attached to the far side anchor point. The BTC pulls out excess slack and ties the transport tightening system using a figure 8 slip knot. The BTC signals Ranger number 2 to pull the knot 12-15 to 15 feet from the near side anchor point. After this, Ranger number two ties round turns 18 to 24 inches off the water with the remaining rope and secures the rope to itself with a carabiner. Ranger number two signals the BTC and the pulling team, Rangers number four, five, and six, tighten the bridge, pulling the transport tightening system as close as possible to the near side anchor point. 12-16. Ranger number one moves downstream and assumes the duties as the far side lifeguard. The BTC ties off the rope with a round turn and two half hitches around the near side anchor point. The BTC places himself on the upstream side of the bridge, facing downstream, and starts hooking individuals into the rope and inspecting them for safety. Ranger number two moves to the upstream side of the rope bridge, assists personnel off the rope on the far side, and keeps the head count going. Rangers number five and six cross with the rucksacks of rangers number one and two. Note: Any ranger identified as a weak swimmer crosses alone so the near side and far side lifeguards can watch him without distraction. 12-17 the BTC maintains the flow of traffic, ensuring that no more than three rangers are on the bridge at any one time, one hooking up, one near the center, and one being unhooked. Once the platoon sergeant has accounted for everyone on the near side, he withdraws left and right security and sends them across. Platoon sergeant follows security across. Ranger number three hooks the BTC with number three's rucksack onto the rope. Once the BTC crosses, ranger number three unhooks the near side anchor point, and the BTC unties the far side anchor point. Ranger number three ties an Australian rappel seat with a carabiner to the front, hooks onto the carabiner that is in the end of the line bowline on the 150 foot rope, and then signals rangers number four, five, and six to take in the slack. Ranger number three extends his arms in front of his head upstream to fend off the brie and is pulled across by number four, five, and six rangers. Except for rangers number one, two, and three, everyone wears a rucksack. Rangers number four, five, and six hook the rucksacks of rangers number one, two, and three onto the bridge by the carabiners. All the ranges cross facing upstream. 12-18 The platoon sergeant and ranger number 5 verify weapons and equipment between themselves. After that, personnel reorganize and continue the mission. For rangers with heavy equipment, all major groups are tied together with quarter-inch cord. An anchor line bowline runs through the rear swivel down the left side of the gun. Tie a round turn through the trigger guard, route the cord down the right side, and tie off two half hitches around the forearm assembly with a round turn and two half hitches through the front sight posts. Tie off the rest of the working end with an end of rope bowline about one foot from the front sight post large enough to place a leading hand through. See figure 13-3 on page 13-10. Note, more information is in chapter 9. M240 and AN Prick 119 Fox. 12-19. The M240 is secured to the bridge by carabiners on the front side post and rear swivel. The M240 is pulled across by the trailing arm of the M240 gunner. 12-20 The Prick 119 Fox are waterproofed before crossing a one-rope bridge. Once far side FM communications are set up, the near side RTO breaks down and waterproofs the radio and prepares to cross the bridge. A carabiner is placed in the top center of the rucksack frame, same as for Rangers number 1, 2, and 3. The BTC hooks the rucksack up to the rope. Note. Using two carabiners binds the load on the rope. Adjust arm straps all the way out. The RTO pulls the radio across the rope bridge. Poncho raft. 12-21. 
Normally, a poncho raft is constructed to cross rivers and streams when the current is not swift. A poncho raft is especially useful when the unit is still dry and when the PL wants to keep their equipment dry. There are several things to consider when constructing and using a poncho raft. Equipment requirements. Two serviceable ponchos. Two weapons. Poles can be used in lieu of weapons. Two rucksacks for each team. Ten feet of utility cord for each team. One slinging rope for each team. Conditions. Poncho rafts are used across water obstacles when at least one of the following conditions is found. The water obstacle is too wide for a 150 foot long section of rope. No sufficient near shore or far shore anchor points are available to allow a one rope bridge. Under no circumstances are poncho rafts used across a water obstacle if the current is unusually swift. Choosing a crossing site. Before a crossing site is used, a thorough reconnaissance of the immediate area is made. Analyzing the situation using METTC, the patrol leader chooses a crossing site that offers as much cover and concealment as possible and has entrance and exit points that are as shallow as possible. For speed of movement, it is best to choose a crossing site that is near shore and far shore banks that are easily traversed by an individual ranger. Execution phase. Construct a poncho raft. Pair off the unit or patrol in order to have the necessary equipment. Tie off the hood of one poncho and lay it out on the ground with the hood up. Place weapons in the center of the poncho, about 18 inches apart, muzzle to butt. Place rucksacks and flick between the weapons, with the two people placing the rucksacks as far apart as possible. Start to undress, bottom to top, boots first. Take laces completely out for subsequent use as tie-downs, if necessary. Place the boots over the muzzle or butt of the weapon, toe in. Continue to undress, folding each item neatly and placing on top of boots. Once all the equipment is placed between the two weapons or poles, snap the poncho together. Lift the snapped portion of the poncho into the air and tightly roll it down to the equipment. Start at the center and work out to the end of the raft, creating pigtails at the end. This is faster and easier with two rangers working together. Fold the pigtailed ends inward and tie them off with a single boot lace. Lay out the other poncho on the ground with the hood up. In the center of this poncho, place the other poncho with the equipment. Snap, roll, and tie the whole package up as before. Tie the third and fourth boot laces or utility cord around the raft about one foot from each end for added security. The poncho raft is now complete. Note, the patrol leader analyzes the situation using METTC and makes a decision on the uniform to be worn for crossing the water obstacle, such as whether to place weapons inside the poncho raft or slung across the back, and whether to remain dressed or stripped down with clothes placed in the raft. Watercraft 12-22 Use of inland and coastal waterways may add flexibility, surprise, and speed to tactical operations. Use of these waterways also increases the load carrying capacity of normal dismounted units. Watercraft are employed in reconnaissance and assault operations. 12-23 A waterborne insertion annex, see Table 2-13 in pages 2-25 and 2-26, is prepared with the unit's op board and special organization is accomplished at this time. The PL designates the most technically proficient rangers as coxswains. 12-24. The Combat Rubber Rating Craft, CRRC, is a lightweight inflatable watercraft that can be used on inland and coastal waterways. There are four separate valves inside the buoyancy tubes and eight separate airtight compartments. To pump air into the boat, turn all valves to the orange or inflate section of the valve. Once the assault boat is filled with air, turn all valves to the green or navigation section. This section is the assault boat in eight separate compartments. The characteristics of the watercraft are Maximum Payload 2,760 pounds, including the engine, personnel, equipment, fuel, and deck. Crew, 11. Overall length, 15 feet, 5 inches. Overall width, 6 feet, 6 inches. Weight, roll-up floor aluminum, 304 pounds. Weight, roll-up floor composite, 274 pounds. Weight, hard deck, 285 pounds. Weight, without deck, 183 pounds. Note, characteristics may vary depending on the model. Preparation, Personnel, and Equipment 12-25 Crew served weapons, radios, ammunition, and other bulky equipment are lashed securely to the boat to prevent loss in the event the boat is overturned. Machine guns with hot barrels are cooled prior to being lashed inside the boat. Refer to figure 13-4 on page 13-11 for equipment tie-down and figure 13-5 on page 13-12 for boat rigging. There are specific preparations, personnel, equipment, and procedures associated with watercraft. These are the rubber boat. Each rubber boat will have a 12-foot bowline secured to the front starboard D-ring. This rope is tied with an anchor line bowline, and the knot is covered with 100-mile-an-hour tape. Each rubber boat will have a 15-foot center line tied to the rear 
floor D-ring. The same procedure for securing the bowline is used for the center line. Each rubber boat is filled with 240 millibars of air and checked to ensure that the valve caps are tight and set in the navigate position. Each rubber boat has one foot pump, which is placed in the boat's front pouch or, if no pouches are present, the foot pump is placed on the floor. Each rubber boat is inspected using the maintenance chart. Personnel and equipment. All personnel wear a work vest or kapok, or another suitable positive flotation device. Flick is worn over the work vest, unbuckled at the waist. Individual weapon is slung across the back, muzzle pointed down and facing toward the inside of the boat. Crew serve weapons, radios, ammunition, and other bulk equipment is lashed securely to the boat to prevent loss if the boat should overturn. Machine guns with hot barrels are cooled prior to being lashed inside the boats. Radios and batteries are waterproofed. Pointed objects are padded to prevent puncturing the boat. 12-26. When rigging weapons to be lashed to the boat, two carabiners are attached to the front and rear of the M240 with a middle of the line bowline connecting the two carabiners. Make sure to connect a third carabiner to the center of the rope. The M249 machine gun also has two carabiners attached to the front and rear with parachute cord attached to both carabiners. See figure 12-3 on page 12-10. Rucksacks have one carabiner attached to the top of each pack. See figure 12-4 on page 12-11. 12-27. Rucksacks are placed in the boat with frames facing inward and tied down through the carabiners attached to the top of the packs. The end of the center line is tied near the bow to the left or right d rings on the bouncy tube with a round turn and two quick releases. See figure 12-5 on page 12-12. Attach the M240 machine gun to the D-ring at the bow and the M249 machine gun to the center line by the carabiners, making sure the weapon is on top of the rucksacks. 12-28. Each ranger is assigned a specific boat position, see figure 13-6, and all have various duties, as well as embarkation and debarkation procedures. This includes A. Duties. Designate a commander for each boat, normally the coxswain. Designate a navigator, normally a leader within the platoon and observer team as necessary. Position crew is shown in figure 12-6. Duties of the coxswain. Responsible for control of the boat and actions of the crew. Supervises the loading, lashing, and distribution of equipment. Maintains the course and speed of the boat. Gives all commands. Paddler number 2, long count, is responsible for setting the pace. Paddler number 1 is the observer, stowing and using the bowline unless another observer is assigned. B. Embarkation and debarkation procedures. When launching, the crew maintains a firm grip on the boat until they are inside it. When beaching or debarking, the crew hold onto the boat until it is completely out of the water. Loading and unloading is done using the bow as entrance and exit point. Keep a low center of mass when entering and exiting the boat to avoid capsizing. Maintain three points of contact at all times. The long count is a method of loading and unloading by which the boat crew embarks or debarks individually over the bow of the boat. It is used at riverbanks, on loading ramps, and when deep water prohibits the use of the short count method. The short count is a method of loading or unloading by which the boat crew embarks or debarks in pairs over the sides of the boat while the boat is in the water. It is used in shallow water, allowing the boat to be quickly carried out of the water. The short count method of organization is primarily used during surf operations. Beaching the boat is a method of debarking the entire crew at once in shallow water and quickly carrying the boat out of the water. Commands 12-29. Commands are issued by the coxswain to ensure the boat is transported over land and controlled in the water. All crew members learn and react immediately to all commands issued by the coxswain. The various commands are Short count, count off. Crew counts off their position by pairs such as 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. Passenger number 1, number 2 if applicable. Coxswain. Long count, count off. Crew counts off the position by individuals such as 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10. Passenger number one, number two if applicable, coxswain. Boat stations. Crew takes positions along the boat. High carry, move. Used for the long distance move over land. On the preparatory command of high carry, the crew faces the rear of the boat and squats down, grasping the carrying handles with the inboard hand. On the command move, the crew swivels around, lifting the boat to their shoulders so that the crew is standing and facing to the front with the boat on their inboard shoulders. Coxswain guides the crew during movement. Low carry, move, used for short distances over land. On preparatory command of low carry, the crew faces the front of the boat, bent at the waist, and grasps the carrying handles with their inboard hands. On command of move, the crew stands up straight, raising the boat about 6 to 8 inches off the ground. Coxswain guides the crew during movement. Lower the boat, move. Crew lowers the boat gently to the ground using the carrying handles. Give way together. Crew paddles to front with number 2 ranger setting the pace. Hold. 
The entire crew keeps paddle straight downward and motionless in the water, stopping the boat. Left side, hold. Left crew holds. Right continues with previous command. Back paddle. The entire crew paddles backwards, propelling the boat to the rear. Back paddle left. Left crew back pedals, causing the boat to turn left. Right crew continues with previous command. Rest paddles. Crew members place paddles on their laps with blades outboard. This command may be given in pairs, such as number one's rest paddles. Canuck capsize procedures. 12-30. The capsized drill prepares rangers to safeguard lives and equipment in the event that the boat overturns. Task. Conduct capsized procedures. Q. The boat team will need to capsize the boat intentionally. This may be necessary when the boat is full of water due to rough seas or heavy rainfall. Conditions. The platoon is conducting a waterborne insertion using CRRC. The platoon has organized into nine-man boat teams. The platoon is all safety equipment required. All platoon organic equipment is tied down according to the unit SOP. The unit has communications with higher and adjacent units. Some iterations of this task should be conducted during hours of limited visibility. Standards. Each boat team will properly rig and lash their boat. Each boat team will intentionally capsize their boat and then right their boat. Each team will recover all personnel and equipment back into the boat and continue their mission. Safety note. During training, the unit should adhere to the water submersion chart during cold weather months. The unit should provide a safety boat for each boat team conducting this task during training. All personnel will be in the waterborne uniform, page 13-1, and wearing a serviceable non-inflatable life vest. Note, boats must be rigged for capsizing. The coxswain ensures that all equipment is secured. This may require additional tie-downs. 1. The coxswain gives the command, long count, count off. After the long count, the coxswain gives the command, pass paddles. All paddles are passed to the rear of the boat. This is done by each crew member raising their paddle over their heads, except the number 7 and 8 rangers, to allow the crew member behind them to take it. The number 7 and 8 rangers, or last two crew members, hold the paddles until the boat is righted. 2. The coxswain designates three crew members, number 2, 4, and 6, to remain in the boat. They will capsize the boat after the others are in the water. The coxswain then orders the other members out of the boat by command. 1 out, 3 out, 5 out, until only three rangers remain in the boat. Once out of the boat, the rangers move about 3 meters away from the boat. 3. The coxswain designates the number 1 ranger who is in the water to hold onto the boat in order to be pulled over onto the boat once capsized. This is done by holding onto two carrying handles. The three crew members in the boat each grasp a capsized line that are attached to three D-reins. They stand up and lean backwards until the boat is capsized. This pulls the number 1 ranger onto the boat when it is capsized. 4. The coxswain designates a ranger to pull the quick release that attaches the center line tie down to the D-ring on the bow of the boat. If the three crew members can right the boat without disconnecting the centerline quick release, then this step may be omitted. 5. The number 1 ranger assists the number 2 and 4 rangers onto the boat to help in righting it. The number 6 ranger, who is in the water, holds onto the boat in order to be pulled over onto the boat once righted. This is done by holding onto two carrying handles. The number 1, 2, and 4 rangers each grasp a capsized line, stand up, and lean backward until the boat is righted. This pulls the number 6 ranger onto the boat when it is righted. 6. Once the boat is righted, all crew members move to and hold on to the boat. The number 6 ranger assists other crew members back into the boat. The number 7 and 8 rangers pass the paddles to the other crew members and are assisted onto the boat. 7. If the quick release on the centerline tie down was released, then crew members will recover attached equipment and retie the centerline tie down. 8. Once all equipment and crew members are in position, the coxswain again has everyone count off using the long count method. The rangers also check to see that their equipment is accounted for. The coxswain then gives the crew the appropriate orders and continues the mission. River Movement, Navigation, and Formations 12-31 It is very important that rangers understand the characteristics of the river and how to navigate the water using various formations. Before embarking, it is vital to know the local conditions of the river and its movement. Common knowledge and terminology used in water navigation includes A bend is a turn in the river course. A reach is a straight portion of the river between two curves. A slough is a dead-end branch from a river. They're normally quite deep and can be distinguished from the true river by their lack of current. Deadwater is a part of the river due to erosion and changes in the river course that has no current. Deadwater is characterized by excessive snags and debris. An island is usually a pear-shaped mass of land in the main current of the river. Upstream portions of islands usually catch debris and are avoided. The current in a narrow part of a reach is normally greater than in the wide portion. The current is greatest on the outside of a curve. Sandbars and shallow water are found on the inside of the curve. Sandbars are located at those points where a tributary feeds into the main body of a river stream. 12-32 
Because rangers number one and two are sitting on the front left and right sides of the boat, they observe for obstacles as the boat moves downriver. If either notices an obstacle on either side of the boat, the coxswain is notified. The coxswain then adjusts steering to avoid the obstacle. 12-33. The patrol leader is responsible for navigation. Rangers have three acceptable methods for river navigation. They are checkpoint and general route. These two methods are used when the drop set is marked by a well-defined checkpoint and the waterway is not confused with a lot of branches and tributaries. They are best used during daylight hours and for short distances. Navigator observer method. This is the most accurate means of river navigation and is used effectively in all light conditions. Navigation equipment needed includes compass, GPS, photo map, topographical map, poncho, pencil or grease pencil, flashlight. 12-34. The navigator is positioned in the center of the boat and does not paddle. During hours of darkness, a flashlight is used under the poncho to check the map. The observer, or ranger number one, is at the front of the boat. Working together, the navigator keeps the map and compass oriented at all times. The navigator keeps the observer informed of the configuration of the river by announcing bends, sloughs, reaches, and stream junctions as shown on the map. The observer compares this information with the bends, sloughs, reaches, and stream junctions actually seen. When these are confirmed, the navigator confirms the boat's location on the map. The navigator also keeps the observer informed of the general azimuth of reaches as shown on the map, and the observer confirms these with actual compass readings of the river. The navigator announces only one configuration at a time to the observer and does not announce another until it is confirmed and completed. A strip map drawn on clear acetate backed by luminous tape may be used. The drawing is to scale or a schematic. It should show all curves, the azimuth, and the distance of all reaches. It may also show terrain features, stream junctions, and sloughs. 12-35 Various boat formations are used day and night for control, speed, and security. The choice of which formation is used depends on the tactical situation and the discretion of the patrol leader. Hand and arm signals should be used to control the assault boats. The formations are wedge, line, file, echelon, V. Securing the landing site, 12-36. If the patrol is going into an unsecured landing site, a security boat can land, recon the site, and then signal the remaining boats to land. This is the best way. If the landing site cannot be secured prior to the waterborne force landing, some form of early warning, such as scout swimmers, should be considered. These rangers swim to shore from the assault boats and signal to the boats to land. All signals and actions are rehearsed prior to the actual operation. 12-37. The landing site can be secured by force with all assault boats landing simultaneously in a line formation. While this is the least desirable method of securing a landing site, it is rehearsed in the event that the tactical situation requires its use. Arrival at the debarkation point involves several steps. 1. Unit members disembark according to the leader's order. 2. Local security is established. 3. Leaders account for personnel and equipment. 4. Unit continues movement. Rangers pull security, initially with work vest on. Coxswain and two rangers unlash and derig rucksacks. Rangers return and buddy system or teams to secure rucksack and drop off work vest. Boats are camouflaged and cached prior to movement if necessary. Quartering party and procedures. 12-38. A quartering party is a patrol that departs ahead of the main body. The purpose is to secure, recon, and organize an area for the main body's arrival and occupation. During waterborne operations, the quartering party leaves early in order to inspect and prepare small boats such as the CRRC, for rigging and lashing. This saves time and facilitates an expedient and tactical occupation and departure from the beach landing site. Procedures include, but are not limited to, Corning party departs ahead of main body. Corning party consists of a senior leader, RTO, security element, all coxswains. Corning party issues contingency plan. Corning party is counted out. Communication is maintained with the main body. Perimeter security is readjusted. Corning party arrives at the beach landing site and establishes local security. Senior leader of courting party conducts a partisan link-up in order to coordinate for small boats. Once boats are identified, coxswains inspect boats for serviceability and equipment. Coxswains use proper commands and lifts to move boats into position to the actual launch point. Coxswains ready equipment, paddles, work vests, centerline rope in preparation for the main body's arrival. Main body arrives and conducts link-up with the courting party and security is readjusted. Information is disseminated among leaders. Coxswains begin supervising and directing boat crews to line up rucksacks and secure work vests. With the assistance of a crew member, coxswains begin rigging and lashing rucksacks and other heavy equipment. Note, coxswains must ensure that the boat remains afloat during loading. Equipment and personnel will cause the boat to rest on the bottom while in the shallow water, which could result in damaging the boat. Once all rucksacks and heavy equipment are secured, coxswains begin directing the loading of boat crews. Remaining security elements are pulled from the perimeter. Security is continued while on the boats to ensure there is no security gaps. Accountability is given to the PLMPSG. 
and platoon is postured for boat movement. End chapter 12. All right, that's it for this episode of Army Flashcards Ranger School podcast. That was Chapter 12, Waterborne Operations. Next episode will be Chapter 13, Mounted Patrol Operations. As always, check out armyflashcards.com for awesome free ranger resources. And until next time, take care.